Well, good evening and welcome to this poetry reading from University Professors Press and the Poetry Healing and Growth series. My name is Sean Rubin. I serve as co-editor in chief of the press along with Lewis Hoffman. And uh, the University Professors Press was established about a decade ago with the mission of publishing books in humanistic and clinical psychology, clinical psychology and creativity studies. We were founded by university professors who were, interest, uh, who were published authors and leaders in the field. Our intent was to found a publishing company by scholars for scholars. While many of our books are intended for a, a wider professional and at times general audience, we seek to maintain a scholarly sensitivity and understanding with all the books we publish. Poetry is an ancient healing art used across cultures for thousands of years. In the Poetry Healing and Growth book series, the healing and growth facilitating nature of poetry is explored in depth through books of poetry and scholarship, as well as through practical guidelines on how to use poetry in the service of healing and growth. Poetry written with an intention to transform suffering into an artistic encounter is often different in process and style from poetry written for art's sake. In this series, there's engagement with the poetic greats and literary approaches to poetry, while also embracing the beauty of fresh poetic starts and encouraging readers to embark upon their own journey with poetry. Whether you are an advanced poet, avid consumer, or novice to poetry, we're confident you will find something to inspire your thinking or your personal path towards healing and growth. And the series editors are Carol Barrett, Steve Fell, Nathaniel Granger Jr., Tom Greening, and Lewis Hoffman. And if you visit universityprofessorspress.com, we have a sale which offers a 15% discount on the entire Poetry Growth and Healing series, which comprises 11 books and using the code PGL279. So again, that's a 15% discount on the entire PGH series of 11 books using the code PGL279. And what I'd like to do tonight is first introduce the co-editors of the book series who are joining us this evening. Uh, first, we have Dr. Lewis Hoffman, who's a licensed psychologist and author. He has authored and edited 18 books, including eight collections of poetry, and is one of the series editors for PGH. Uh, he's published articles on the use of poetry and therapy. An avid writer, he's had over 100 journal articles and book chapters published. He's been recognized as a fellow by the American Psychological Association and six of its divisions for his contributions to the field. He serves on the editorial boards of the Journal of Humanistic Psychology, the Humanistic Psychologist, the Journal of Constructivist Psychology, and Janus Head. He's the executive director of the Rocky Mountain Humanistic Counseling and Psychological Association and teaches at the University of Denver, the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs, and Saybrook University. He lives in beautiful Colorado Springs with his wife, three sons, and two dogs. And while not, work, while not working, he enjoys spending time on his bike and hiking with his dog. And also we have Dr. Carol Barrett, who holds doctorates in both clinical psychology and creative writing. She has published two volumes of poetry and one of creative nonfiction. Carol teaches poetry and healing courses for two universities and has published poems in many literary magazines and anthologies, as well as journals beyond the field of literature, including JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. Her scholarship has appeared in journals in psychology, women's studies, gerontology, education, and dance and art therapy. So welcome Drs. Hoffman and Barrett. And I wanna start with a few questions. Uh, first, what got you both started writing poetry? Perhaps we'll start with Dr. Barrett. Okay, thank you. Well, I, was, I got a late start um, and I hope that my experience will encourage perhaps some of you in the audience who aren't yet writing poetry, but might wish to. I actually began writing poetry seriously when I was 30. And um, what happened for me was that I was doing research with widowed women and looking for sources that would be helpful to them. And in those days, that was in the 1970s, uh, we had card catalogs. You go to the library and you use the card catalog to find something helpful. And what came up was the play Arsenic and Old Lace when you typed in widows or, or widowhood. Um, and it soon became apparent that there really weren't many helping resources at that time. 
So it occurred to me that a book of poems might be helpful to widowed women. So when I went to a colleague, um, Anita Skeen, who was teaching poetry at Wichita State University in Kansas, I proposed that we work together on a collection of poems about widowhood. And uh, I wanted to have a poem in the book. <laughs> so, so I wrote my first poem and um, she had a lot to say about it and mentored me for several years. But that was really my beginning. The impetus was to create work that could be healing to others. Thank you, Lewis. Well, you know, I, I, I started writing poetry in, in high school, uh, just as uh, in one of the classes that I was taking and um, really enjoyed it, but then fell away from it for, for quite a while. And it was when going through a difficult time in my life, the ending of a difficult relationship that I started writing again. It was a time when I was also um, uh, early in my career as a psychologist and just started weaving the two together, having no idea that other people had done this and there was a whole even organization and training programs in poetry therapy at that time. But it was something that uh, just felt kind of natural to me and I integrated it probably more um, even into the teaching that I was doing at the time, regularly reading poems and uh, I had this great big binder uh, of poems that I carried around with me to, whenever I was teaching and would regularly just uh, pull one out when it seemed to relate to it. And, um, and that, that was kind of the, the start for me, but it's, I, I've said a number of times that I've often felt like uh, poetry is, is one of the best therapists that I've ever had. And, um, and so it was very much through that, that personal experience and, and just witnessing in myself how healing poetry was that, that really drew me towards it. Mm. Uh, Nathaniel, I Thank don't know you. About, about you. Say, say again, I'm sorry. I was just saying, Nathaniel, how about you? Oh, uh, you know, I, um, I, I've, been, I've been, I think I've been, well, I've been moved by poetry um, ever since I was a child. And, uh, 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 growing up in the in the in the in the 70s, particularly the, the early 70s, my 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 mom and dad had uh, had bought a, a, a little tiny house of maybe a thousand square foot home, and that's the house we grew up in. And down in the rumpus room, uh, my dad had uh, two psychedelic posters uh, of a one of a black male with a big afro and. And that poster was titled "Black Magic," and then, uh, and then there was another one of a woman uh, with a big afro and breasts exposed, and 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 that was "Black Magic Woman." And neither of those posters really uh, uh, wowed me or intrigued me as, as a little boy. But what I found myself intrigued by was between these these two posters was a poem by 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 Fritz Perls. And at the time, uh, I would commit that poem to memory, uh, not knowing that uh, later on in life, of course, I would come to find out who, who Fritz Perls, uh, uh, who, who he really was. And, and, and I remember the, the words of that poem shaped my life as a little boy and perhaps even as I grew up into adolescence, into manhood, and a very simple, short poem, I do my thing and you do your thing. I am not in this world to live up to your experience, and you are not in this world to live up to mine. You are you, and I am I. And if by chance we find each other, it's beautiful. And and and, and my way of being is just predicated upon that the, the, that poem. And so coming up through elementary school, I, I wrote poetry, uh, tried to write uh, rap songs, and and just toyed along with to, to, toyed around with with various arts, but I really was drawn to poetry. And then later in high school, submitting a poem to, uh, they had a, a national poetry contest and I submitted a poem and 
of course, I, I was very disappointed that I didn't win, but I, mm. I, I thought I would win. Uh, but I've just been so moved by poetry ever, ever since. And, 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 and not just the, not just the, 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 uh, the written word, but I think the spirit of poetry, I think is what really intrigues me is that uh, it's, it takes on a, uh, seems to take, take on this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, exoteric, uh, this metaphysical thing that happens when, 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 when I engage with poetry and I, and I allow poetry to engage with me. And so I'm very, uh, very passionate about poetry. Thank you. Uh, next question for you all to consider. In addition to healing as a potential outcome for poetry, what other functions does poetry have that are significant for the psyche? Maybe back to you, Dr. Barrett. Sure. Well, um, that question makes me think of Mary Oliver and her constant encouragement to pay attention. Pay attention to what is happening in the world whether it's a small piece of the natural environment one is reflecting on or the broader social landscape. So I think poetry encourages us to be very particular in our observations. And uh, from that basis, we can make more informed decisions. And we can also have the um, pleasure of noticing small kinds of happiness that exist around us. And another function that was very important to me when I was starting to write poetry is that we can salvage moments through poetry that otherwise would disappear. If we didn't record them, we would somehow lose them so that we can record and preserve really important, significant moments that we experience. Thank you. Lewis? Yeah, um, I, I think one of them that signs, stands out for me, uh, uh, particularly coming from a background as an existential psychologist is the way that it can help uh, preserve and deepen meaning, which I think fits very well with what Carol was talking about, that there's lots of ways that um, uh, poetry just uh, it just brings meaning out of something where we maybe didn't see the, the meaning there and through that I think it's one of the ways that it transforms suffering um, but it can also be a way to add a joy to life um, it can help uh, deepen our connection with things like nature um, and, and I think one of the things that's really drawn me to it as well is how it can impact relationships and deepen the connection in relationships. And uh, I think we think of that sometimes in romantic relationships in our culture a lot more quickly. And, and certainly I think that's one um, wonderful way that poetry can help deepen relationships. Um, for me, uh, that was very powerful. I remember when uh, still dating my wife, there was one time for her birthday that I, uh, I just hand wrote her um, a book of poetry and that was something that um, the process for me of doing that really deepened the relationship. But I've also noticed it in other relationships, for example, with clients that um, a practice that I often have in, in therapy is when I come out of a session and I'm uh, not trying to think through or, or figure out something that happened that wasn't quite clear, often we'll, we'll turn to poetry. And what I've found is that um, quite often writing uh, poetry following sessions instead of progress notes or starting with the poetry before writing the progress notes often helps uh, clarify things that are happening, helps me feel more connected, deepens my empathy with clients um, through that process. I love that idea about uh, poetry as a process note for therapists. That's really intriguing. Yeah. Uh, also with regards to the creative process, what do you see as the relationship between revision work on a poem and the healing process? I'd be happy to talk about that, but I wonder, Nathaniel, if you want to respond to that 
uh, earlier question about the functions of poetry beyond healing. Yeah, I would. I, th I thought that question was somewhat profound and, and, and very thought-provoking thought and that uh, my mind just went straight to, uh, to the struggle. And, 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 and sometimes life can uh, issue struggles that are um, uh, too harsh or too uh, uh, challenging to talk about and, 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 and hence to even deal with. And so uh, life's realities are, are just, uh, it, it, you know, it, 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 to, to, to not be overcome by life's uh, realities or the reality of the struggle. And even those things that are just totally absurd. One thing, one thing I like about poetry, it, 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 it helps us to, to better see the reality of, uh, the, of the absurdity, so to speak, and that we can better deal with it. Uh, it's a healthy outlet and uh, as, a, as a healthy way of expression. And, um, and, 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 it, and, it, and it safely helps one, and I can speak sp especially from a, from a, a perspective of uh, multiculturalism, it helps, um, it helps me to better uh, uh, be able to deal with the, 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 the many negative nuances associated with multiculturalism and diversity uh, without lashing out. It's almost a healthy way of protest. And so uh, you, you, you asked, how does it, how does it uh, 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 heal the, the psyche or, 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 or help the psyche? Uh, I, think it, I think my mind, I think I go, you know, uh, when I think of that, I go back to the, uh, to the, to the, uh, th that spiritual component, you know, uh, poetry helps me to deal with, it helps to heal the psyche. And when I think of psyche, I think of soul. Uh, psyche literally meaning soul, and so poetry just has a way of um, uh, uh, fe uh, feeding the soul and healing the soul, but also it allows the soul to express itself when you can't express yourself no other way. Thank you. Beautiful comments. Um, uh, Sean's question about um, revision. Um, Revision for me is a really core part of the process of creating a new work. And when I'm working on a poem that comes out of a particular anguish I'm experiencing, I find that revision is a way to help me see that experience as a blessing, as difficult or challenging as that may be. So that what happens when I write a poem, initially the draft is messy, it's all over the place, um, it's got tensions, it's got cliches, uh, it has no form or structure. As I work on it and refine it, I find myself making something beautiful in the world so that the initial anguish or angst that inspired the poem um, becomes something that can be a gift to the world. So for me, the healing is really not complete until the poem is a work of beauty, even if it deals with trauma. I really like that and it, it um... I find both some similarities and contrasts a bit uh, to some of my own experience with my own writing, but also with, with kind of um, uh, working with people um, around it, that uh, I have found the, the various versions can often be powerful. One of the things that I've encouraged uh, with clients a number of times is to keep revising a poem or, to, or just to rewrite a poem at times, but to keep track of each of the revisions. And then along the way sometimes go back and look through the revisions and it can be really powerful to see how it's changed and sometimes it's small things sometimes it might just be one word that that, that changes but it, it makes um, a profound difference for that person and uh, there there's one set of poems that i wrote and i didn't even conceptualize it as rewriting the first one at the time but when i um, when I looked back on it later, realized that it, it pretty much was a rewriting of it. And uh, it's a couple of poems that are in uh, one of the 
the books in the Poetry, Healing, and Growth series, Our Last Walk, the first two poems that I wrote about my dog, Emea's death. And uh, in the first one, there's a, a line in there about how um, it was a peaceful night, but it held no peace for me. And then in the, the next poem, it shifted to being that it was a, a peaceful night, but I would not accept its peace. And when I wrote that second poem, I hadn't even remembered that line, the first one, at least consciously. But that to me was so significant, that shift from the idea of something that I was thrown into that was beyond my control, that it had no peace for me to something where I had a role in there that I would not accept its peace. And as I, as I recognized that, it really had a, a, a very, profound effect on my own grieving experience. They were written a little over a year apart and, uh, and it really was something significant. So watching those changes, I think can, can be powerful, but I also have seen a number of situations, both with myself and clients where that, that refinement to getting to the, that final part um, is so much part of the, the completion too. So that I think both the journey and the, the ending can have um, a lot of power in that process. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Granger, would you like to comment on the uh, relationship between revision work on a poem and the healing process? Yes, yes. I have, I have found with my own personal uh, 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 knack for revision to, uh, that, 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 that sometimes it has gotten in the way. It is somehow, sometimes it has blocked uh, the healing and that I was trying to uh, perfect the, the poem. And, and so on one hand, I certainly welcome revision, but I think revision should be met. And I kind of heard it pretty much said here, revision should be uh, met very cautiously and trep uh, trepidatiously. And that it can, uh, I think sometimes too much revision can sterilize the the poem. Um, one of the reasoning, one of the reasons, and one of the focus of uh, uh, functions of the poem is to uh, to get down and dirty, to get to dig into the recesses of the of the soul and the, and the psyche, and to and, and to um, uh, to bring out the the good, the bad, and and and, and the so much ugly. And, and sometimes I have found with, with myself revising, I want to clean it up and I want to make it right. I want to make it politically correct. I want to make it acceptable, uh, not, not really realizing that the most accepted piece would be the piece uh, that the original. In fact, in, in Capturing Shadows, when I wrote, uh, when I wrote one, one, one Last Tear, that that poem, th just writing that poem, um, uh, uh, lended itself to 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 such a, a a cathartic release that the the I mean it was it was tears all over the paper and and I wish there was a way I could have published it as is with the teardrop stains and 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 and. Uh, and 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 the you know <laughs> the mucus and whatnot, and because I was a total mess in in, in writing that poem, and and uh, and now that I go back and I read it, it still has a it, it it still has an impact on me every time I read it. And uh, had I and and there's some words I could have changed or fixed or tweaked, but leaving it in its in its form as it came to me. Uh, it, it made it made it all the more uh, therapeutic. So powerful, thank you. Uh, next question for you all to consider: uh, What po when, with poems that you really admire, what stands out for you? Um, two things. Uh, one is titles, because sometimes the title takes me in a totally different direction with the poem. Um, I, I'm thinking of a poem that's all about 
uh, birds. Lots of details, uh, exquisite um, um, conversation about the poet's regard for birds. Um, and even without the title, it's delightful. But the title is The Long Marriage. And it gives this poem a completely different meaning because now I'm thinking of my parents who, you know, were married over 60 years. Um, I'm thinking of the qualities that the poet sees in the birds and how those might have a human uh, representation. I mean, so titles that really shift my perspective, I really um, appreciate in a poem I admire. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing is uh, the use of images, the way in which the poet connects something familiar to me with something else. And I have never thought of a connection between those two things before. That's something I really admire. Thank you. Lewis? Yeah. I might uh, summarize uh, Denise, a poem by Denise Levertov that kind of is my answer. She's one of my, my favorite poets that uh, just love her work. And she's got a, a poem called The Secret of Life where she talks about uh, these two young girls that find the secret to the meaning of life in a poem that she wrote. And she talks about how she loves them for finding in her poem what she could not find in her own and, uh, and for forgetting it so they could find it again and again and again. And when I, when I um, think about what grips me in a poem, it, it, it's different. I, I think my answer today, tomorrow, next week and six months from now would probably be drastically different. But I think the biggest thing is um, the, the honesty is one of the things I'm really drawn towards in poems. When they're, when they're honest, when they're vulnerable, when they reveal, I think that's one of the things that is con very consistent. And the other, I think very similar to some things Carol was, has said is, I, I love when poems can hold together a paradox, that, that um, things that just seem like they shouldn't fit and if you were to try to explain them uh, in an essay, it would be um, probably mind-numbing, boring, and wouldn't get through to anyone about how these things are really connected. But a poem can illustrate it in fewer words in a more profound way. Thank you. And Dr. Granger? Lewis, I, I like that, that, that statement. It grabbed me that it has a way of holding together a paradox. And when you said that, my mind just went straight to Tom Greeny because so much of his poetry does that. Is If you read it, it's the, these things, that, these terms he would use and wordings he would use that wouldn't typically fit, but he makes it fit. And, and, and it is, it's just reading some of his poetry is just, it's, 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 uh, it's almost like playing a game of chess almost. And, and I, I, I really enjoy playing chess, but uh, it, just looking at the strategies and how he works the, in, in connecting these paradoxes is just, uh, I think that's what makes Tom Greening's poetry uh, uh, different, but, but very captivating, uh, the paradoxes. One of the things that I, that I, that I really look to in, in poetry and, and, and and, and not just in poetry, I think even in, 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 in working with clients and working with my students um, and in much of the work I do, if there's one thing I look for that is voice. It is the, the voice, I try to hear the voice of the poet come through the poetry. When I have my clients write poetry, I really, uh, I, I, I read the poetry looking to hear their voice in, in that poetry. And so there's one thing I, I, I look for, even when I write poetry uh, and I read my poetry uh, and reading my poetry and, 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 and the voice is very important. And, it, and I can read two or three of my poems and each poem may have a slightly different voice, but that voice 
it gives energy to the poem. And so I look for that, I look for that voice. Really great. Thank you. And just a final question for you to respond to tonight. Uh, what are some of the benefits of an anthology of poems on a particular topic? Well, one of the benefits of an anthology is the marvelous diversity and range of points of view, of uh, vicissitudes of that particular topic. Um, some poems may take us back into a historical perspective. Some may move us forward as futurists. Um, but being able to like open the book anywhere and get a nugget of someone's truth is such a treasure. If you have a book of poems by the same person, that can be a lovely experience, but often um, that kind of book, poets will spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to organize and sequence the poems. Whereas in an anthology, anywhere you grab can, can be a treasure. So that um, if you don't particularly respond to one nugget, you, you know, you turn the page and there's another one. So there's some real advantages to having uh, an edited collection of, of very different poems about the same subject. I, I think it's a, it's a great question. And um, I, I think of things through that, that healing and growth lens always, because you know, I'm not, I don't consider myself a professional poet by any means, that uh, I'm someone who I think uh, tinkers and loves poetry very much, but um, I've never been able to really have the time to study the craft as much, but have been able to study the craft much more in that healing and growth context. And that's, I think, fitting with what um, Carol was saying that, you know, it looks at it from different angles. And what we tried to do with the Poetry Healing and Growth series is have a variety of poems that are very intentional in, in the anthologies in that series, and not all the, the books in the series are anthologies, to have different styles of poems and, and also different qualities of poems, different ranges. Because if, um, if every poem was Mary Oliver, it'd be very intimidating to think about trying to, to go out and, and write your own poem for healing and growth, because not many people can be Mary Oliver. But, um, but, there can be very powerful and wonderful poems that make a difference in someone's life that are maybe something that's a little bit more accessible, a good poem, um, but not necessarily a, a professional poem. Uh, and so I think that for me, one of the advantages is when there's that diversity, you can find different things to relate to. You can find different um, angles uh, for the looking at the poetry. I think Carol really, I, I think you, you really, really answered that, that question. I can't even add anything to that. And, 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 and Louis, you, you uh, expounding on that. I can't really add anything to that, except that uh, uh, I guess the more the merrier. And I love the term nuggets. You know, I like to be able to flip through uh, 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 the pages and find these, these jewels. And I think it comes with the the diversity of writing, and it's it, it's uh, yeah. I, I can't really add to it. It's just it's so much. It's 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 just beautiful. It's beautiful to be able to 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 do that. And like like Lewis was saying, it was just Oliver. You wouldn't be able to just you may get lost. You would just or if not lost, at least maybe stuck. You know. Uh, and so I love the fluidity of anthology. Yeah. Well, I want to thank Drs. Barrett, Hoffman, and Granger for such a rich and powerful discussion. Uh, there could be a whole book just on these uh, profound questions and answers that you shared tonight. So I want to thank you very much for that. And now we'll proceed. I'll turn the program over to Dr. Hoffman, who will uh, help to set up the order of the poetry readings. You're muted, Lewis. Uh, uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, 
for the for the guiding us through this and the questions and also for letting me know my mic was off there. But uh, um, now we'll go through and we'll have a number of poets that have uh, contributed to the Poetry Healing and Growth series read a, a poem of two of theirs. And after each poem, we'll, we'll allow for just a, a brief, a few seconds of silence to allow for a transition and, um, and a moment of reflection about the poem. So uh, to start off, Carol, would you like to start us off? Sure. I'm going to read uh, two poems. And the first is from the, um, can, I don't know if you can see that, um, from the Lullabies and Confessions anthology, um, which deals with poems about parenting. And this is a poem called Waiting on my daughter's night class. The silversmiths assemble, basement workshop where the rumble of polishers does not disturb paramedics in uniform t-shirts or mechanics in greasy garb. I settle in, worn naugahyde couch in the hall, the comfort of humming vending machines finger my options. Unshaven students come, sip coke, and go. Some even risk hello, or lament the lack of work, hands in their pockets, or tilting a blue cap over raised eyebrows. Once that young, I was taught to say yes to the first man who asked me out. He'd summoned the courage. Fairness insisted you went where he led. Beyond the open classroom door, I hear the rhythmic tug of rock music and know despite a migraine, my daughter will not complain to her young teacher blue denim shirt sleeves rolled to the elbows. He coaxes companion artists, all women, in the contours of blue wax. One is etching the lines of a leaf, a real leaf in her lap. They carve and file, brush and smooth. He will mold imaginative jewels, then fill singular anticipations with molten silver, pale as first light. My daughter has formed her first ring. I hear him admire its balance, its weight, sun dance plane that will glide on her finger, lift to bluing skies ahead, carry the knowledge she can leave any man she chooses. And the next uh, poem I'm going to read is from the Capturing Shadows series. This one, Poetic Encounters Along the Path of Grief and loss. Um, I'm going to read a poem called Snowfall, which was inspired by an older woman, a woman that I knew when I lived in New Hampshire. And I began to think that I hoped I would be able to end my life when the time came the way she was ending hers. So it's written in the first person as I imagine the end of my life, but the inspiration was uh, someone else. Snowfall. A few days before I die, I'll shovel a thin ribbon along the muffled walk where old flowers verge their snowy heads in the thickening bed. I'll stroke the library banister long way down to the basement floor, the record player spinning its scratchy hymn. The girls 
will be taking off their scarves and rolling thick beach towels on the beige carpet, each in her own space. I'll go to the head of the class, greet each pink face like a new poem, begin with a shoulder roll, a brisk whirl of the hands. Midway, we'll stop to rest. Someone will put water on in the kitchenette. I'll remember my grandmother rising each morning from the yellow chenille to sit-ups on the hardwood floor, then teach the younger women things which pulse through us when the shape of hips no longer matters. We will coach each other past funerals and broken wrists, our bodies warming the chattering air. Someone's granddaughter will be visiting her braids long as our scarves. We will take turns saying how quick she catches on, her waist bending to a tender compass. After the last curled spine extends to the top of the hour, we will sip tea and stories, then pass through the upper chambers where new books gloss the round tables. My hands pressed to the glass door like a prayer, mittens disclaiming imprint, the squeak sounding behind me as the indelible snow takes over. Thank you, Carol. Those are beautiful poems. Nathaniel, you're up next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Uh, I love that that pause after a poem where you just want to just sit with it and just it, it, you just want to stay with it. And 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 I think that's one of the one of the things that uh, two things, but that's one of the things that led to the first book in the uh, poetry healing and growth series was stay a while. And in the name stay a while uh, uh, came about uh, from a uh, multicultural class I took when I was working on my master's degree. And we decided to meet outside the classroom at uh, one of the students parents house and the student's name was Shannon. Well, Shannon just loved the, the multicultural gathering so much where we would read poetry and, 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 and just look into different uh, areas of multiculturalism and diversity. And uh, she would always say to me, and I'm sure she said it to others, but I took it personally, she would always say, stay a while, have another glass of wine stay a while, have another glass of wine. Well, as fate would have it, uh, Shannon uh, and another classmate were uh, driving to Texas and they were uh, uh, fatally, uh, uh, fatally killed in a, in a car accident. And that stuck with me. And so when Lewis and I decided to do a, a, uh, a book, a poetry book on poetic narratives and multiculturalism and diversity, and trying to come up with the name, I just thought, uh, apropos, stay a while. And so uh, I said tonight, I was not going to read a poem from Stay a While. I just wanted to just talk on, a, just mention the title of Stay a While and its origins. But um, um, I will read this particular poem and you guys have probably heard it before. And I think really why I wanna read this poem tonight is maybe for a different reason than what, what I would normally read it. I wanna read this poem tonight just to uh, demonstrate voice with, with the poem. And then I will read another poem that I wrote in, in, in Silent Screams. And Silent Screams is of the poetry, of the uh, poetry uh, growth series. Uh, po uh, Silent Screams is perhaps the most um, sensitive volume for me and that it lended itself to, uh, to, to just great vulnerability. And I, I was in my hotel room 
And I can't remember where I was traveling, but I was traveling, I was in my hotel room and I thought back on how, if, if it was some time ago, I would not have been comfortable in my hotel room. And I thought about addictions, I thought about drugs and I quick, I called Lewis Hoffman, I called Lewis, I was like, Lewis, I got an idea. We need to do a poetry book on addictions and recovery because I felt this over or this overwhelming feeling of 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 of, of addiction just trying to overtake me, and uh, and so and that's how this book derives derived from "Stay a While." That their book uh, it came about in uh, to. Uh, 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 I was in Chicago and many of you have heard this story before. My brother and I were uh, having a beer or two in his man cave. We were talking about black on black crime in Chicago. And from that conversation, we thought that, wow, these kids, they, 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 they can't read or write, but they can break down weapons. They know the name of every drugs. And, and uh, where did this originate? And I said, well, that goes all the way back to slavery. It's a slavery mentality that you know, the blacks couldn't read. And from that, that their book uh, 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 derived. What you doing? Put that book down. You's gonna get us all in trouble. Who learned you how to read anyway? Miss Pauly, you tell Miss Pauly don't she ever learn you how to read no more. You's gonna get us all in trouble. Master said, the biggest sin for a Negro is the sin of learning. Master said, Negro ain't supposed to be learned. Master said, Negro supposed to be trained. Just like that strong mule out back, and like that mare over there, like all the other animals on this here plantation. Master said, it says it right there in the good book. You's gonna get us all in trouble. You's be better off siring the master's handmaid than to get caught reading from that there book. My daddy couldn't read. My mammy couldn't read. Eyes can't read, and eyes be damned if I allows one of mine's to read from that there book. If the master don't kill you, I'll kill you myself. So help me God, you's gonna get us all in trouble. You's gonna get us all in trouble. And this poem is, uh, uh, is, the, is the title poem of the book, Silent Screams. And I think I wrote this or start writing this from the hotel room that particular night when I called, when I called Lewis, Silent Scream. People laughing at the absurd, gunshots, sirens, Music pumping through house speakers, eerily imitating the pounding in my chest, the bass beating the drum in my ear. And yet, most deafening is the sound of silence. In its quietness, I hear my name, called only to offer just one more. I answer, knowing that one is never enough and 10 is too many. Again, I go there, nowhere in particular. I answer the phone, the ringing only heard by my own ears. I close the blinds to hide myself from the watchers watching, the peepers peeping, while the tweakers tweak and the sneakers sneak in hopes of muffling the silent scream. But then I drop a piece 
In desperation, I combed the shag, picking their rug like my own fro to find the piece I dropped, the piece of my imaginings, the piece of my mind, a piece of my dignity. I am hungry, but cannot eat. I eat, but cannot swallow. I scream, but cannot voice the pain from within the abyss. I'm tripping, falling deeply even. Shattered glass reflects like diamonds, the hours that have become days, the days, weeks, weeks, months. What's today's date anyway? Yesterday, a year ago, it was better than life. Alas, today, it is worse than death. And no one, no one, but perhaps God will hear my silent scream. Thank you. Thank you, Nathaniel. Both very powerful poems. I, I've heard you read that their book probably 15 times or more now, and every time it, it brings some tears up, but uh, I'm glad that you chose to read it. Uh, I, I'm up here next, and I'm going to read uh, two poems here. The first is from Journey of the Wounded Soul, uh, which is a, a book on spiritual struggles, and we, we're very pleased that, that Thomas More, a very famous uh, um, writer on religion and spirituality, if you're not familiar with him, wrote a beautiful foreword to the book. And this is the, the opening poem in the book. And um, I dedicated this uh, to a friend of mine, Johnny, who had helped me um, at a time when I was uh, feeling guilt about the way my own spiritual struggles was uh, impacting someone else. That, uh, and um, he shared with me a story and, and let me know that um, he said, anyone that knows me knows that I'm someone that uh, always struggles with spirituality and, and with many things, that that's uh, part of, of who I am. And there was a, a peace that got in that. And, uh, and it came through to this poem. It's called Waiting for the Blessing. God, we've wrestled for many years. I feel your weariness growing. You know my fight is sincere. I don't challenge you for enjoyment or ego or even the pure pleasure of rebellion. I struggle because it is who I am. I struggle because it is the only way for me to be. I wrestle you between the light because it is the only way I know to hold you close. Many years ago, in a dark night, a friend shared the familiar story of the night you spent with Jacob, wrestling through the darkness, waiting for the light. Jacob, a mere mortal, would not be overtaken, and you blessed him. So here I am, God, wrestling in the darkness, waiting for your blessing. I feel you close like never before, and I will not let you go. But when, dear God, will you give me your blessing? I think one of the things that poem for me helped was to take ownership of an aspect of myself. Um, this next one, is, was in two of the books that uh, originally in our last walk and then ended up again in our walk with nature. Um, in part, the walk with nature is a, a collection on uh, poetry about nature and how nature encounters with nature can be healing. And for me, um, dogs have represented nature. Uh, particularly, I've been drawn towards the Northern breeds, particularly Huskies and Malmutes. And so this was, one that was written about uh, the dog that I had mentioned before. And I, I wrote it at a, a National Association for, for Poetry Therapy Conference. And it was one that, that really surprised me. I was intending to write a poem in a different direction. 
And this poem just brought me in this direction, whether I wanted to or not, it seemed. It's called Distance Encounter. Uh, and it was, uh, again, reflecting many years after the death of, of my dog. On a, um, and she had come back to me often in dreams that I found through the years that regularly when uh, I was feeling in need of comfort, she would emerge in my dreams. So I knew that she was playing a particular role in my psyche. Your eyes fall upon me. I should be scared but I cannot find any fear. There's something familiar in your eyes. I feel safe. You watch as I move among the trees, standing firm in staring pose. I want to come close. Reason prevents me. Squatting down, shoulders softly angled. I return the intense stare from your eyes. They are brown, not the familiar blue. Yet something in your something in their presence says it's you. Amea, I speak softly. Is that you? Your stare remains firm, and I unafraid. I want to come close, yet hold my distance. I feel you calling with your wolf eyes, as Amea so often did with hers. I lean back into a tree sinking to the cold ground as rough bark scratches my back, still holding your gaze. You lay head on pause with loving stare. I should go, I think, but I cannot leave this comfort of you returning to me. I pull my jacket tight as the crisp night settles around. The wild night with all its strange sounds surrounds but I know you will protect me, your pack. And I sleep a needed sleep, finding a calm I've been aching for. In the crisp morning, I awake, noticing fresh paw prints, matted grass next to me. Briefly, you are there again in the distance, eyes still on me. Then you run off into the trees in the distance. You turn, your, you turn back. One more long gaze as your new pack walks up. Walking to my truck, snow gently blankets the ground as I ponder my foolish night, seeking reconnection in the cold woods. It couldn't have been her. Then in the distance, I hear a familiar howl. Tears bind joy with sadness. It no longer matters. Next up, we have Lorraine. Ah, thank you for inviting me. This is just amazing. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, okay. I'm a psychologist teaching doctoral students in the Department of Clinical Psychology at Antioch University, New England in King, New Hampshire. I've had a lifelong passion around poetry, creativity, and meaning in life, as well as loss and grief. And they're integral to my clinical work, my teaching, and my research. In fact, my dissertation many years ago was on the creative process of a visual artist and creativity is part of my co-authored book, Daughters, Dads, and the Path Through Grief, Tales from Italian America, uh, which is psychology rather than poetry, but poetry in it. I'm working through a massive data set on Bruce Springsteen's female fans, another intersect with creativity and meaning making. So as I was trying to decide which poems to read today, we visited my daughter in Washington, DC, and she brought us to the beautiful and holy Franciscan monastery and gardens there, which I never knew existed, a place totally new to me. And that made my decision crystal clear. It was kind of like um, synchronicity, as Jung would say. So this poem is called Passeggiata with St. Francis. And 
Passeggiata is an Italian word for a special kind of evening walk they take, and it's from the journey of the wood, wounded soul. So Passeggiata with St. Francis. We walk, you hold my hand, lead me through the dark passages down the stairs. You always went first. The light above, the frescoes by Giotto, the earthquake fissures, the glory of God, the bright light of transcendence, the colors Giotto dared to use. They dazzle us, but we cannot stay there. You let me look and visit, but we must go down into the cool, into the dark, not so close as the catacombe. No, the air is more sweet here. The space is bigger. The sanctification is immense. San Francesco is immense, is a traveler of the world, of heaven and earth, and many places in between. Is here in my heart always, and now you are here also in this darkness, walking with him in his visions, in his death, walking with you, airy but powerful, no substance but all substance, filling me up, filling up the spaces. Why did you leave? And how is it you are here in the crypt, in the grave? as I circle the grave of this greatest saint, saint of sun and moon, San Francesco, a spirit strong enough to hold your strong spirit. I didn't know you would be here, but how could I now have ever not known? The path has been so muddled without you. Where did you go, sister? Navigating off on a tangent now. Now the paths become clearer, come as one, once again, complete. In this realm of dark, of cool, of eternal moment. And now to come back to this continent. This poem is called uh, Colorado to New Hampshire. The last time I was above tree line, a young boy died, a boy just old enough to begin to be called a man, a boy of length and height, but inscribed within an angel's shawl. Because we dared to trek through spaces of alien planetscape in the sear bright light of air, so far from how people live and thrust ourselves above boulder and cairn to hail the sun. The sky opened up and plucked him from this bleeding land. This time it is a Japanese crag dome of fog and cliff. Angles of black and gray slice in hexagons at each other while moss strips Rock strip, pine hugs the ground and drips. Mist hides in silk shreddings, a notch in the bluffs, where water slides across the path and all is slipping downward. Curtains part wispingly as I tremble in descent, but redressing is swift and I glance back to nothing. Visitor, from where hail ye? And to where dost thou journey? Only for a moment, only by the grace of some mirthless spirit are we allowed to pass. Not even an old monk hermit on these peaks. Look for the path, for that is all you have. Nay, there is no path. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. Those were those were lovely. Um, next up is uh, Tamiko here. Let's 
looks like maybe not. Maybe didn't had something come up. Um, Jason? Hi. It's good to see everyone. Um, I have this thing, this is Connoisseurs of Suffering. And uh, I spent a lovely season with Lewis over this book. I would remember the season, maybe it was summer, maybe it was spring, it doesn't matter. What matters is that we collected all of these submissions from people, all of these wonderful poems. And we sat around Lewis's house reading poetry and crying. That's just about the best time of my life. It's, it's so lovely. And just trying to do the lightest of editing on these things to, to leave them intact and uh, just touch them so gently so they would mean what the authors uh, wanted them to mean. I see a couple of the authors here and it's, it's, it's good to see you. It's good to see your faces. So I have a thing from the back of this. It was published first in uh, Lewis and Nathaniel's collection, uh, The Stay a While that Nathaniel was talking about a minute ago. And it's in the back of this. It, uh, it, it, it means a lot to me. This is about uh, uh, a friend I was traveling with who, he was in his 70s and uh, he just sort of started to fall apart in front of us a little bit. So there's a poem about him. Faded Chinese ballroom. Outside the garden flourishes under sunlight and humidity, well tended and full of life. A black butterfly flits past on some inscrutable errand. Fish glimmer in the pond, as shiny as the coins dropped there for luck or hope of luck. Inside the hall is filled with mold spores by a rattling air conditioner that chatters over a carpet past its prime. Insects crawl in the curtains in this ballroom past its time. Outside the men's room, a rice bug lies on its back kicking feebly its battle already lost. The place is slowly being reclaimed by the earth. Chairs brightly covered in Chinese sensibility sink slowly back into the ground. This is a place past its time. Outside the window we can see disrepair reclaiming the roofs. Inside, the paneling and crown molding are damaged. Things are stained, shabby, but full of bygone grace and elegance. Cherubs who will never age watch from their painted faces on the doors. It is a beautiful place. An aging friend growing wrinkled and scarred by time. Perhaps it will be plowed under soon. Too old to be popular, but too young yet for reverence and preservation. Perhaps this place could be better cared for. Perhaps some new paint, some effort with sandpaper and a hammer could reverse some of the entropy here. But for now, the entropy has its own beauty and that neglect is essentially benign. Thank you, Jason. Uh, lovely poem and uh, I deeply appreciate uh, the heart with which you read the poem as well. And next up we have Derek. Yes. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Glad to be here with everyone. That's definitely a lovely event. Good to see everyone's faces. <clears throat> um, so, you know, I'm, 
I'm happy to be here because I'd like to, I guess, share, you know, some poems from really the nature series. So the, you can see that. Walk with nature, poetic encounters that nourish the soul. <clears throat> um, and so, I guess really to kind of start, um, you know, really the poems that I want to read, I think are in reference to um, really also just kind of the internal state that I've been kind of going through over the last, I think, month or so. Um, you know, just really thinking, you know, really, I think being a, a Black American living in, you know, the current United States and with everything that's going on, <clears throat> you know, I just want to, I think, give voice to, I think, a lot of the I think, internal struggles um, that folks, uh, my persuasion at that point, are likely going through in these days. So. so first, I would like to start uh, with a poem called True Nature. I found the forest inside myself. And for the sake of love, never cut a limb, branch, or trunk. And said, I sat and sunk, deep between roots and dust, bugs and funk, breathing like a Buddhist monk, I came to peace. And so the, the other poem that I would like to read, I think kind of goes more specifically to, I think kind of just the internal, if we're talking suffering in that sense, really the suffering strife that I've kind of been experiencing really over this last month. And so this poem, it's called Scars of Terra. Scars of Terra, earthly fissures, churning, moving through fiery resistance, balancing pain with love, blood of my ancestors, coloring the earth, tears of the earth carried on breath, nourish the body, feed the soul, transform the land, love my ancestor. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Derek. Those were, those were lovely. Um, I, let's see, I believe I got something. I don't, don't believe Gina's here. I think she, uh, Sent a message right before that she wasn't sure if she was going to make it. But let me just check. Yeah, it looks like not. Okay. Um, so next up we have Tammy. Uh, hey, hi. It's been very interesting. Thank you for having me, Carol. I love you. Carol is my, was my dissertation chair. She got me through. Some of my students are in attendance, so I hope they're listening. And thank you so much for inviting me, Louis. So I'd like to read two uh, quick poems. And the first is entitled Watching Ants, which is in your wonderful uh, anthology. At first, I wanted the whole world to burn, every creature in it, nothing left, no sea, no foam, no poem. I didn't care about the boy next door kicking dead dandelion heads off his lawn or the bamboo shoot poking up through the tar road to get to sunlight or the ants toiling to get dirt out of their hill. I just wanted it all to be gone, never to return. How dare children laugh in the waves and mothers smile in delight? How dare cars stay in their lanes doing speed limits? I wanted to sink the Haiti, taking everyone with me. 
no more sea breeze or starlight or linguine with clam sauce or two tea bags in a cup. Then after time smoothed the jagged edges of my pain, I saw life in her perpetual way continued. She didn't have the luxury of lying in bed day and night, not caring, not wanting. Now I stop to watch ants build, thinking how silly we all are, but the work must continue, doesn't it? So that was the one that was in the anthology that I am so proud to be in. And this one is entitled Turning 40. I'm sorry, Turning 41 for Mike. Kids in high school, college, career in New York City, maybe Long Island, driving a car that's seven years old, telling your wife that you love her, 32 waist and now 38. Cut the lawn, cut the lawn, cut the lawn. Watch Ray Donovan, CNN, ESPN. Go to your mom's for Sunday dinner. Clean the garage, clean the basement, clean the attic. Tell your wife you love her. See more gray in your hair today. Play softball, not more golf. Take multivitamins, drink V8, quit smoking again. Cut the lawn, cut the lawn, cut the lawn. Clean the gutters, clean the car, clean the patio furniture. Tell your wife you love her. Watch the Dallas Cowboys without Romo. Go to your mom's for Sunday dinner. Take the dog to the doctor. Take the cat to the doctor. Take yourself to the doctor. Boycott Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. Tell your wife you'll love her. Stop at the yard sale. Stop at the 7-Eleven. Stop at the four-way stop sign. Go to your mom's for Sunday dinner. All this and more, you were denied. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. And next we've got uh, Carol uh, I'm not going to be able to say the name, last name right, but uh, our other Carol. Carol Stadronsky. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for including me. And uh, this is just such a wonderful, I mean, Zoom has its limitations, but and Facebook has its limitations, but it just, I feel like I'm, you know, sitting in a room with poet friends, and it's really lovely. Um, I have two poems that I'd like to read from Connoisseurs of Suffering. <clears throat> the first is The Immensity. We stand at the cliff edge, looking at the ocean. A pod of pelicans flies low over the water. Waves crash on the rocks below. The children have been coming forward, telling what happened the only way they know how, with flashbacks. My mind saved me by hiding memories, by separating me into so many parts. Now we are sharing the terrible things we could not bear to share before. Every day we have flashbacks of the parties where children were hurt. We were hurt and other children died. We hear the cries of gulls. Amy wants to leap from the cliff, break her body on the rocks below. We stand there a long time on the edge. We manage to keep her safe, to hold her. Our work now is loving each other, reaching out and holding hands. When a large winged dog comes to Amy, she softly touches his fur, then holds on tight. Many of us are furred and feathered. To be able to fly was necessary for our soul's survival. Is everyone inside being held or holding on? It is a mystery how we can do this for each other. We were fragmented, lonely selves, sliced apart by pain and the necessity of not knowing. Then child after child came forward, and each one shared her part of the story. So now we know. At the cliff edge, children are picking up stones from the ground, 
wrapping words around their stones, whispering or shouting their pain, their anger, their longing, throwing their stones hard into the ocean. The ocean is so deep. The ocean is large enough to hold our grief, to hold our sorrow. And the next one is lullaby. Honey, don't cry. There will be a day the sharp stones in your head won't hurt you anymore. All the sharp stones one day will be worn down with ocean, worn down with time. The bad men were here, stomping around the room, hurting us and breaking everything, broken glass on the floor. And my dog, she's crying. Her paws don't have shoes. My feet are naked too, cut and bleeding to the bone. So we now both are crying, licking our own salty blood with our healing tongues. The world will be all right, honey. The world will be all right. Dry your tears, honey, on that sweet dog's fur. It's all over now. The smashing is done. Your feet will be all right, honey. Your sweet feet will be all right. The bad men are gone now. The bad men are all gone. Time, it passes no matter what we do. And God's deep, cool water is lapping in and out again. Lapping in and out again. Stick your feet in the water, honey. Bathe those sweet feet. Bathe those sweet toes. Feel the cool water on your feet and in your mind. The smashed glass and sharp old rocks are polished smooth in time. All the sharp edges will turn into smooth stones and you'll be dancing, dear honey, running and dancing on those feet. And sweet puppy, she'll be dancing by you, leaping and dancing and barking with joy. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Those are beautiful poems. I'm gonna read one more poem that's from Tom Greening from his book, um, Into the Void. And Tom Greening, uh, he's one of the series editors for the Poetry, Healing and, and Growth series, but uh, he, he's getting somewhat older and not able to join us tonight. And this, this collection really is, it's a powerful collection. It's um, called Into the Void, and the subtitle is An Existential Psychologist Faces Death Through Poetry. And for a number of years, as he was um, aging and thinking about his own mortality, he was sending me poems um, about facing death. And so at, at some point, I asked if we could put those together into a book. He had a couple of other uh, poetry books that were published by University Professors Press, and, and he agreed. And it's uh, it's really powerful that uh, with all of his poetry books, he integrates a lot of wit and humor with very serious topics. And it, um, the way that he does that uh, can help push to think and reflect, um, but somehow the the wit and the humor lightens some of the it with these very difficult topics. So this is the, the last poem in the book and it's titled, How I Want to Die. With no great final drama, here's how I want to die. Some warm and cozy evening, I'll simply say goodbye. Or fussing in my garden one cool and rainy day, the world will hardly notice that I have slipped away. The roses still will blossom. The worms will do what they do. I hope that what I planted will bring delight to you. Tom is someone that I used to tease that, uh, that he could think in poetry. I remember him sitting in uh, workshops at the the Saybrook residential conferences, Saybrook University's residential conferences. And instead of taking notes, he'd often write poems and then share them. And they often were 
uh, these lovely summaries of what was being presented and the way that he could uh, so quickly bring things to poetry was really um, quite a, a gift and, and shows his, um, his wit and, and just talent as a poet. I, I can't imagine to be able to, to write poems like what he does in that, that short of space. But as we now are done with the poetry reading, what I'll do is invite all of the, the, the poets who read tonight. Um, you can unmute your mics if you want. And we have a few minutes just to, to discuss a little bit reflections from tonight, as well as uh, just any thoughts about poetry, healing, and growth from, from everyone. Well, okay, as I tell my students, I'll be a volunteer. Uh, I think poetry um, saved my life. As a teenager, I just couldn't speak about what had happened to me. And through words, I was able to go ahead and salvage whatever I could of my peace of mind. And it just grew from there. And so um, I, I, it's my mistress and, and, and I worship her every day. And uh, I don't mind saying that. So I think that poetry is vital, uh, even for those that don't think they've had some kind of crisis in their life, because they may know someone who has, and it, it helps make that connection. And I'm so thankful that I found poetry as a way to uh, keep my sanity. And uh, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be here tonight. Um. I, I do think it helps one keep one's sanity. I would totally agree with that. I, I think what I'm struck with, um, I feel like I've been to all these different physical places tonight, um, just with all the different poems. Um, Louis, yours with the dog, I felt like I was right there. And I, I wasn't even aware when I chose my poems that they both had geography in them, you know, from Italy to Colorado to New Hampshire. And then I feel like we've, We've like been to all these different sites. Um, and, and it's something about, I keep thinking about how important that relationship to place and the earth. And so of course I kind of just remembered that Robert Frost was like my first, one of my first loves in life. Um, never mind just in poetry. I mean, just I was so overwhelmed by Robert Frost. Of course, living in New England, you have to be. Um, and and teachers start his work in school real early and um, just that connecting up. I, I just feel like all the connecting and just feeling connected here too. Um, so connecting place, people, images, I, I just, that's what I'm thinking right now is connecting. I really appreciate that. Uh, you know, place does shape so much. I, I think the one series we did, uh, The Walk with Nature, really um, highlights that in so many ways. But you know, the poet you mentioned earlier, who's one of my favorite, Bruce Springsteen, um, <laughs> he, he, off, he also really calls on place a lot, place. a lot of those images. And that's very much part of, of his story and the way a poem can transport someone by place, or a song, in his case, can transport someone right. to a place is, is one of the yeah, really powerful aspects of it temporal spaces too. I find myself uh, meditating, Lewis, on uh, Tom Greening's poem that you read and especially the conclusion of that poem about uh, his wish for what he has planted. Mm. And um, my sense is this evening that the poems we have heard um, are gifts and um, I experienced um, a range of gifts. There, these are plantings. These are things that I now can take inside me and they are blossoming. So, you know, I really thank everyone who read for the treasures that were shared. And uh, I find myself echoing Tom's wish um, for what it is we have planted, that it might grow among others.
I find it incredibly healing, both to be able to speak my truth, which often it's not appropriate or there just isn't the entry to be able to speak our truth in day-to-day -day life um, and in many situations. And in poems, um, I really, it's just incredibly necessary for me to be able to speak my truth. And within a poem, things are accepted that um, might not be accepted in polite company or in, in reasonable sane company. And so um, both being able to speak my truth and be heard. Uh, I've been in a women's writing group for 27 years now. And so we know each other really well. And when I was 52 years old, I started therapy. Um, and within three months, I was diagnosed with DID. And to be able to bring, and then child parts started coming forward with sharing the things that the surface ones who had done the day-to-day -day life didn't, um, didn't know about. And to, so to be in a group of women in intimate relationship with a group of writers and to be able to speak my truth and have my truth heard was incredibly healing. Um, and it was, was a group where we had sat with each other's truths of other you know, painful life and real and raw life experiences. And so the po poetry has been a way of holding that you know, and communicating that in a kind of a sacred space where you're able to put things in a poem and then be heard. Keros, I certainly share your, your sentiment in uh, uh, being able to speak one's truth. And I personalize that being able to speak my truth and poetry is the outlet for that as I can, I can allow myself to be vulnerable. I can go allow myself to be authentic and that within, an, in a, that within and of itself is healing and, and, and just very therapeutic. I think so oftentimes uh, we hide behind these these masks, and but poetry allows me to take the mask off. And uh, and even though we write in allegories and sometimes symbolisms, it still allows us to take that mask off. I guess for me, I think of uh, really like harkens to. I think of like Harlem Renaissance, I think of spoken word poetry, um, just really the importance of being able to speak your voice, but also speak it with the, the full range of emotion that you have. <clears throat> Whereas I feel like most times with our words, we're really forced, I think, to, you know, divulge emotion and take it out of that in the sense of communicating in this rational, like <clears throat> empirical way. Whereas I feel poetry is really is about speaking to your experience, your inner experience <clears throat> and other people's inner experience of that, if that is you know, a place for that too. So, you know, to me, it really, I, I've always loved the ability to be able to write poetry and speak poetry in a sense to be able to say something that's going on with me that, you know, maybe there's not a space in everyday life to do. Appreciate that always. Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you everyone for for joining us. Is there anyone, any of the other poets that wanted to share anything before we wrap up here? Okay. I, I just want to say I, I really appreciate being here to, tonight, particularly, I I struggle with being here. I I, I this week I, I I'm in dealing with the suicide of a of a 12 year old kid right now, and uh, and just totally emotionally 
drained and didn't think I would be able to participate tonight. And, uh, and I'm still tired, but I feel somewhat rejuvenated just by hearing everyone's uh, voice and hearing your voice come through so clearly, clearly through the poetry. Um, it's, it's just so uh, incredibly inspiring that uh, I'm just filled with so much gratitude tonight. I'm just so happy to see each of you and, and to hear uh, to hear each of your voices uh, really come through. So thank you. Um, I wanted to just say something about the role of shame in our culture. Um, that I give a lot of talks on loss and grief and people talk about how they often get shamed for still feeling feelings about loss and grief. You know, oh, it's been six weeks or a year or whatever. And I just think there were so many, and, and Carol, I'm thinking, I thought of this when, when you were talking, Carol, you know, yeah, <laughs> with Carol, I'm sorry. With Carol S. It's hard, hard to read. Like there's so many experiences that in any culture, not just our culture, it's probably different from culture to culture. And, and I'm not imagining we're a monolith either, that so many experiences are just shamed and like, you're not allowed to have them. And I feel like in, in the books that you've done and the poetry that the things that you've focused on, um, a lot of things that, that are often silenced and shamed are just here. And I'm just really feeling that right now. And, and um, uh, just wanted to say that, that it's, it's, a, it's an opening for things that you don't get a lot of opportunity to talk about. So again, thank you for the whole uh, the series. Um, people get made fun of because they miss their animals, you know, but they get shamed. Oh my God, my cat. I'm, I'm amazed he's not here with me right this minute. He usually is, you know, he's like my life. Um, just don't tell my husband that. Um, but um, anyway, a non-shaming space, a really open space as Carol was talking about with her writing group. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you. I really appreciate that theme coming out that I think is so important and, and it's I think one of the reasons why poetry is therapeutic um, and it's one one of the things with the with the feedback that we've got on the series that one of the most common uh, statements that people will say is the books help me feel less alone and I think that really speaks to that because so many of these things that aren't spoken elsewhere they are spoken through poems and if you can read a book of poetry and feel less alone what an amazing gift that is yeah. all right well thank you everyone for for coming thank you to all the poets for reading and, and sharing uh, your poetry and, and also your heart um, with the poetry healing and growth series through the end of the month, there is going to be a, a, a discount. I think it's a, a 10 or 15%, I think 15% discount on all of the books, including if you buy the entire series of, I think it's 11 books now, which is already discounted. There's a, um, another 15% off of that. If you, it's only good at the University Professors Press website and you use the coupon code at checkout, PGL, 279. That's PGL 279. And uh, I'll see if we can get that up in the, um, the chat there. But that um, is good for all of the um, books in the Poetry Healing and Growth series to get that 15% discount. We did three of these events through um, National Poetry Month with April and coming to a close. If you didn't get to see the, the first two, but would like to they were done on Facebook Live as well. So they're available on the University Professors Press Facebook page. And I believe they're also gonna be added to the um, University Professors Press YouTube. So you can watch them in either place. So again, thank you everyone. It's wonderful that we had a chance to come together and celebrate poetry and particularly its role in healing and growth during this uh, wonderful month of National Poetry Month. Thank you for inviting me. Bye-bye. Yes. Bye. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank everyone. you, everyone.